recording has started. Well done. <clears throat> um, it's okay. We haven't got that far. We're still on workshop agenda. So this is this agenda essentially is listing out that diagram, but in worded format. I essentials of a contract. The battle of the forms becomes a very interesting topic. Um, we'll try and deal with it as best we can. Please use the chat forum as much as you can on that one because, and I'll pause when we do get to there, because I think a lot of people have found, get confused with what, when a, what is a contract, when does the contract come into place. So getting to the first section, the pre-contract. Pre-contract essentially is as it says. Now, here's a common dilemma, I think, in the construction industry, particularly, I guess, electrical contractors, subcontractors more, more so than just electrical, mining can turf. So, okay, you've submitted your quote to the builder. Let's use the big bad builder. Let's use, by way of an example, BGC, because I've got a slide later on. You submit your quote, and perhaps others, of course, have been invited to submit their quote. So you put the quote in, a little bit in advance, but you think it'll take you 12 weeks. You've given a bit of notice that providing you start on the 1st of October, 12 weeks, not a problem. The only thing you quote didn't mention, like I say, was payment terms, but you did talk about it specifically and they said not a problem. Great. So all good. Typical builder, you don't hear anything from them. So you assume that it's all gone away. And then 4.55 today, you get a phone call or get an email attaching their purchase order. It says it's accepted your quote. Great. It says exactly the same price. Great. Got a few printed words at the bottom saying about it's based on their standard terms. Um, but nevertheless, you've never seen those terms before. They've never discussed them before. So you're thinking all good. Then the cover email from the construction manager of the PO as is always with any construction manager, they always want you there yesterday. So it's five to five today, start and site tomorrow morning, ASAP, already suggesting you're gonna be holding people up if you don't. So these are, these are dilemmas that, uh, I don't think that situation is a million miles from what may happen more often than not. But the point is, I just want you to think about that scenario and scenarios that are similar to that after we've seen a couple more slides to just see in context as to we'll go back to this and then circle back as to what to do next. So understanding contract. Now I'm not gonna sit here and talk like a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, by the way. I'm a, a working arbitration expert work, trained in a bit of law, but I'm not a lawyer. I don't practice as a lawyer. Nevertheless, understand, understanding the contract is an important aspect for anybody. So essentially, you've got these four requirements, really, um, to what a contract requires. It needs a verbal agreement of some sort, or it could be a written agreement, purely written, or it could be a contract that's formed by performance. And by that, I mean, um, if you've installed 50 meters of cable for somebody, and you've dug a trench, and you've done all, the, all that works, and you didn't write anything, and you didn't verbally do it, it was just... I don't know, third party sort of explanation, then by performance, you've done some work for them that they've got the benefit of. And then obviously any combination of the above. So they're kind of the basic starting points for a contract. In terms of the aspects that you require to, to form a contract is legal intent, these five aspects. So legal intent, and I'll apologize if, if I'm preaching to the converted ear and people, lots of people know about contract law, but I'm not going to go into any further than this. So legal intent is that exactly that. You intended to be legally bound by your contract. So for example, if you did some charitable work, um, you know, you, you wired somebody's house for telethon for free, well, you never intended to be legally bound. So if you, if something failed, you not, you shouldn't be legally bound and capable of being sued. Legal capacity, what that means essentially is that you've got to be um, over the age of 18. In other words, to be enabled to be go into a contract. You've got to be able to be um, sober, not under the influence of drugs, uh, not mentally challenged. 
things like that. So that's legal capacity, which I'd like to think everybody that's with the NECA should fill that category. Consideration, I've said sometimes, consideration is where you basically get something or give something in consideration. So on a very extreme simple level, if I go and buy a beer, then they give me a beer and I give them $6 or whatever it'll be. Both of us have given some consideration. Clarity, pretty much as it says, the intention of a contract are supposed to be written as clear as they can be so that there is an intent to be clear. I'll give you $500 if you go and install 300 meters of cable. You know, there's a scope of work, there's clarity, not I'll give you $500 for doing some electrical works. And then offer an acceptance. Offer an acceptance is the reason why I've highlighted that and I'll touch on it a bit further is because that seems to be the aspect that uh, most people fall over on in terms of when the contract has come into place. So armed with the rationale of all of those aspects is that if you've got a contract and you may have unwittingly got a contract in place by following those aspects. Once you've satisfied all that, the idea is, is to, to make sure that you've done it on the basis that you, you wanted to go forward on a contract, not on the basis that the other party may have wanted to go forward. So tip here is I'm saying, get your own, ter own terms and conditions. As the bullet points are saying there, they're fairly self-explanatory, but uh, your own terms and conditions give you your framework on which to start a process in terms of particularly the offer and acceptance. Now, I don't know what size companies you all are. Some of them are fairly large by the looks of the name. So, so a lot of you wouldn't even get a chance to, to perform the works based on your terms and conditions. You'll typically get given the subcontractor or their, their terms and conditions for the main contractor here is please find attached. But if you've got your own terms and conditions as an initial basis on which to put your proposal forward, then you've actually set your benchmark and your, your sort of your guidelines, if you like, as to what you want to work to. So that gives you something when they give you their terms and conditions, it gives you something to check against and a checklist to see whether those terms are covering all of the things you wanted or whether they're bringing in completely different provisions that you haven't considered. So, yeah, like I'm saying here, gives you a chance to set yourself up, avoid the ambiguity. Um, the, the third from last point, when I said to have to avoid having the implied terms of the Construction Contracts Act, which is adjudication legislation. Um, although I'm saying it help, you know, you might want to avoid that. In some some cases the implied terms are actually useful for you. So if you do go forward on a, on a handshake in the pub to agree to wire somebody's house for $5,000 and you just shook hands and, and that's the verbal contract. And then if there is a dispute for whatever reason, they don't pay you, then not having written terms won't be a problem because the implied terms of legislation will then automatically kick in. And like I say, implied terms of legislation generally in fact, everywhere are better than probably the terms that you may have otherwise signed up to with the big bad contractor. We can talk, maybe in the future we'll do a talk on the Construction Contracts Act, but have a look at it. You can download that on the web. It's not, not big, but it's quite useful uh, legislation to look for. So, setting yourself up to win, like I say, it's all, all of this process is is a checklist process that you want to do with regards to engaging in an offer and accepting process of, of uh, contracts. You put forward a price. Just I have seen I've just seen a chat come through. So Lyndon, great. Oh, sorry, um, Lyndon's question: Is it true that your terms and conditions cannot be given at the time of invoice? That is true because you can give them. By all means, you can give them. But what you, the terms and conditions are the terms and conditions of, that somewhere on the way the parties have actually signed into. 
they've agreed um, what each one's going to do. I'm going to deliver, I'm going to install X numbers of meters of cable and 20 lights, 30 light switches. That's what I've agreed and you've agreed, the other side has agreed to pay me $10,000 for that. Then I start the work. If I've started the work, then the contract is in place. So you're saying in your question there, Lyndon, that you're asking about putting the terms and conditions forward at time of invoice. You've already had your contract in place, potentially a month before, because you've been doing the work and you're now invoicing. So you can't suddenly surprise unilaterally uh, decide the terms of the contract a month after you've started the contract. The slides that we'll come on to actually might uh, help explain this further, but but the answer essentially is yes, you can give them the, you could give them those terms and conditions, but they will not be enforced just because you've given them at the time of invoice. Hopefully that makes sense. So in terms of this process here where I'm saying set yourself up to win rather than lose, is that almost follow that process. If you've got your own terms and conditions, great, you put your proposal forward. Then of course they might question things. So you want to negotiate with them, they might give you their terms. If you look at theirs, you read and review them and check them with the specification, you check them with the drawings. Allocating functions, this is, you know, who's doing what? Is it is it are you supplying free issue material? Are you supplying scaffolding or are they supplying scaffolding? Um, things like temporary power, you know, are you supplying it or are they? Are you clearing the access for yourself or are they? Things like that. Think think of all of the things that could cause you grief and then basically go through that process at this time at the beginning. Allocate risk, who's who's got risk for floods or damage or vandalism. Then look at the change process under the contract that you might have signed up to. See what variations, how variations are dealt with. Um, what kind of processes there are to get a variation paid. As you'll see further on in the slides, there's some very draconian and long-winded process just to get a variation for one new light switch. Um, change conditions, again, look at you know these ground conditions, project conditions, delays, increased work, all of these things you want to look at in terms of those provisions before you before you sign a contract. Look at the payment provisions. Some contracts say I'll pay you 30 days, put your invoice in at the beginning of the month and I'll pay you 30 days after the following month. And then you think, well hang on, if it's the beginning of the month, and then at the 30 days after the following month, and that actually is technically 90 day payment terms. So have a look at those provisions and see whether there's weasel terms in there that are trying to catch you out. Point is, and the emphasis is getting back to the offer and acceptance, the bolding is read, reread, re-review, and do all of this before you sign any contract. So again, bouncing back to your comment there, Lyndon, um, this is a process you want to do before you lifted a finger, before you've installed the first of anything, not at the time of putting the invoice in. <clears throat> so the offer and acceptance, this is the misunderstanding. So offer and acceptance, essentially, first party, i.e. you, you the electric, electrical subcontractor, you offer to do something, and you offer it to do it on 28-day payment terms. You offer to you install rooms A, B, and C, and you save for a price. The only time that the contract actually crystallizes and becomes in play is when the other side accepts your offer without any amendments, without any changes. So in that scenario I just said, you said 28-day payment terms, um, rooms A, B, C, and five, $5,000, and they accept your $5,000, rooms A, B, C, for 30-day payment terms. What that means is they actually haven't accepted anything. They've come back with a counter offer. As, as small as it be, i.e., changing from 30 day payment terms to 28, or, sorry, from 28 day payment terms to 30, as subtle as that is, that's a different, they didn't accept anything. So the black and white of law is if it's not accepted in its entirety, then it's not accepted at all. Hence the counter offer becomes. Uh, something that you then accept. 
or don't accept. If you accept it with a slight amendment, then you've made a counter offer. And so the game continues. Um, <clears throat> this is the stage, like I say, most subcontractors I get involved with, particularly at dispute at time, is where they think that their contract was accepted based on their terms. And then when I look into it further, I find actually no, they didn't. They accepted it on the client's terms or on the builder's terms or, or even neither. Then they've accepted it based on um, what's, you know, terms of the implied terms of legislation would then kick in. So going back to that common dilemma, you submitted your proposal 24th. Linda, no, nope. silence. Now that's a... That's also a, a, a good point, which I think we'll touch on in, in one second, if you bear with me, just on in this scenario. So, um, but don't sort of, silence is a form of, it's, um, all right, you're catching me out now. Yes, there is an acceptance uh, in a way that you conduct yourself. It's not that it's silence, it's that you carry out some work without having a, a, fi a final response back. So if I go back to, or the scenario where you put the proposal in, if they haven't come back with anything and you start work, then that's the silent period. And by you starting work becomes, confirms that the contract must have come in place as acceptance because they didn't say anything. <clears throat> and in this example, I'll, I'll show you now, I might sort of explain that clearer. So the, the thing is what to do next. Now, if we're in a room together, um, I mean, does anybody want to sort of suggest what would you do? Some people may think, look, I don't want to get the construction manager offside. So I'm going to jump through the hoops and start, start work tomorrow morning. Now, if anybody says yes to that, that's not, that's not very ab you know, abnormal in the industry. People will do that. Um, alternatively, you might say, well, no, uh, I've just noticed the small print. Let's have a look at the small print. So here's just an example of a BGC contract, uh, pur purchase order, should I say. And as I say, if your eyes are as bad as mine, you couldn't read that at the bottom. But it says conditions. So I'll just made it zoom in on the next slide, hopefully. And this is what the conditions say, point three, further down. It's these, this purchase order is subject to the purchase order terms and conditions, which form part of the contract and is incorporated by reference herein. Now, they've not even bothered giving you the copy of those. Copy of these documents available online, blah, blah, blah. This is a very normal terms that are put at the bottom of POs, usually in font eight or smaller. but what that's done is created a situation where you put your proposal in, you've got all your standard terms and conditions, and they've accepted it back to that scenario there, the 500,001, 500, accepted everything. But if you sign that purchase order and then proceed, or even if you don't sign that purchase order, if you then start work tomorrow morning at six o'clock, then the last document that's been in place is that purchase order. And it was sent to you at 4.55 today. And you didn't question it. If I'm sitting there as an adjudicator, I go, well, you didn't question it. You received it clearly because you did what it, the construction manager asked, which is you turned up at site on six o'clock in the morning. So I can only assume that you've accepted that clause three requirement that it's saying that this purchase order is subject to their terms and conditions that you haven't even read. And this is the danger where people fall into this trap. So you rush off, start the work, thinking that your terms and conditions have been adhered to and bound into and agreed to, when in fact, completely the opposite. These terms and conditions say 50 day payment terms, they say um, variations, you do it for free. All sorts of things, you know, if you get caused by delay, it's not my problem. All sorts of problems that you haven't read. So, <clears throat> so if in this, I don't know, the, 
this chat will work, whether would anybody hazard a guess or attempt to type what you would do if you've got this purchase order and you really want to start work tomorrow morning and you've got those words on the purchase order? Anyone want to give me a guess as to what you'd maybe think about doing? Reject it, yeah, good point. And, and rejecting it, but you want to start, the, is if you're rejecting it, do you mean reject the whole work and just not turn up? Um, I mean, I, I would day worksheets, yeah, but but you but the day worksheets, you've got to be careful there because uh, you've still got to create a contract. And this is a renegotiation. So I, here's, here's how the scenarios I would throw up. I would say the best scenario is you say, I note that point three, send him an email back, thanks for the PO. I know that point three says about your terms and conditions, but as you're aware, you've never given me a copy of those. I'm going to go to this online thing now and have a look at them and email confirmation. Well, you're confirming what? That's the that's what you got to remember though. And my point there is, if you downloaded that that contract and you saw that it said 350 page contract is their standard terms, you've either got to read read the whole contract make your amendments where possible send it back with your amendments which obviously is not going to happen at five to five on the today or the best thing you do is you say if you want to sign it and keep it simple you sign that po and you write on the front of the po my terms and conditions in the event of a conflict or between the terms and conditions your terms and my terms or an ambiguity between your terms and my terms, my terms and conditions will take precedent. And then you sign it, and then you PDF it, and then you send it back. And what you've done then is you put your terms and conditions back on the top of the pile. Now, if you send that back at quarter past five, and back to your silence comment, comment text, um, if you send that back at quarter to five, or Lyndon, sorry, or quarter past five, and then they don't respond back, and then you rock up on site on six o'clock in the morning. Well, if I'm standing there as a third party independently, I can see that you've started work based on your terms additions taking precedent. So that's that's how I get around that one. So that is your email converse, confirmation. It's putting you having the last serve. Now you'll soon find out what kind of beast you're dealing with because if you send that across and then they go, no, 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 come back with a, or call you up and say, no, 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 we can't have your terms and conditions take a precedent. Mine, mine have to, this PO has to go forward on mine. Then the next recommendation is you say, well, that's fine. Then at six o'clock tomorrow morning, instead of me rocking up with a crew on site or to site, I'll come to your offices, I'll sit down in your boardroom and I'll go through your contract and we'll negotiate it. It might take five hours, it might take a day, it might take a week. The point is, do not start the work until you're happy that your contract in place is what you want uh, or is something that you are willing to t tolerate rather than just doing that picture at the beginning when I said blindly signing a contract. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of the importance of contract um, and what I'm trying to get across that um, you know that the, the battle of the forms is a, is a very simple yet often overlooked process that uh, they can catch out most subcontractors. So yes today worksheets but all of these things are all after the contract has come in place. And this is the bit where I'm saying here, get the contract in place before you lift a finger. Before, and when I say that, before you order materials, rock up on site, start excavating trenches or whatever. Make sure the contract's in place. Just in case the last document that served had these terms. Hopefully that makes sense, guys. So um, and feel free to send questions again if, if, if not. I'll try and go through. Now here's um, where I've ha helped. Having said all that, this is when I've done a contract review before for an electrician. 
and made amendments to the terms and conditions that were sent by the builder. And of course, this is the sort of type of responses back you get, which I'm, I'm sure you're also very nervous about, you guys, because you always never want to try and um, cause trouble with your client and be seen to be a you know a contracts lunatic. But nevertheless, sign up to terms, as you'll see further on the slide, sign up to terms that really are commercial suicide is equally as bad as as just um, not signing the terms or even walking away from a contract. So if they do send you this, you might get away with, you know, reducing it just to the top five list. But if you've got top five issues changed rather than zero, that's better than nothing. And then you've still got to take a choice as to decide whether you whether you want to go forward with this contract or not. So in terms of typical provisions looking at, I mean, this is, so if you're a small contractor and you're working with just home builders at a small level, maybe the terms and conditions aren't quite as onerous as the, some of these ones I show you, but uh, but if I do a contract review, uh, or if I, if you're doing, receive a contract from the builder, don't think you have to look at every single one of these clauses here. The ones I've highlighted in yellow are your typical clauses that I would focus in on. I'd go straight to what's the construction of the contract um, in terms of is it schedule rates, is it lump sum, is it fixed price? Uh, I'd look at the interpretations just to see what definitions they've got. Uh, because sometimes they've got very interesting definitions that really try and limit your entitlements to anything. Um, notices, service of notices, you, you, you look at that and you see if a, a notice has got to be written in hieroglyphics on blue paper and sent to God himself and you can't do anything. Well, you know, all of these things might be, um, might be things that start to flag up in your mind as to whether you're going into a very difficult contract. So retentions, they're, they're further on, I think, on the payment, on the next page, sorry. And so superintendents, representatives, uh, progress claims, pro, uh, pro, sorry, progress and programming, i.e. delay and prolongation and time, delay. And then the retentions part you're saying here. So <clears throat> variations I'd look at, um, certificates, certificates and payments, and then, then issues there related to obviously release of retentions. And then time for notifications of claims again. These are the time barring is one of the big problems with bigger contracts because lots of contracts put restrictions on um, in terms of how how quickly you know you, you must notify about a variation or a claim or a delay. And if you don't notify within X days, then you waive your rights to recovery. Waiver of conditions, that essentially just in legal terms just means um, that if the term said you must notify me within five days and you've done the job and you've been done the last variations and you've never notified at all, but yet you've been paid, then you'd argue that, that they've waived strict enforcement of the, the conditions of the contract. What that clause, unfortunately, will be saying is that words to the effect of if I do waiver the conditions at any one time I can change my mind later. So they're Weasley clauses you'd really want to look at and maybe consider amending. So in terms of that's that's how to do a contract review and then I'll, I'll then show some contract clauses that you've got to watch to avoid. So turning to contract administration now that's literally as it is, it's if you've won the job and you've signed up to the contracts and hopefully you've signed up to something that you are happy to work with. Uh, they might have quite lengthy notice period, notice requirements and you can't lift a variation without a written instruction and things like that. I mean, they're quite normal terms. But nevertheless, you've signed up to it. You've, you know, you've made that decision. If that job needs another contract administrator on the job, then it needs another contract administrator. I'd recommend, I've never seen anybody yet go bankrupt because they've allowed for one contract administrator in their tender, but they've got two and the job went bankrupt. 
I have seen many people go bankrupt where they've allowed for one contract administrator, didn't get two, never complied with the contract, and then lost money hand over fist. So it's it's an important thing to to you know, make sure that you comply with it and you administer the contract as it's as it says. I'll give you some. Now these are clauses, and I beat up my friends John Holland regularly in my examples here, just because they they can write some brilliant clauses that are very evil and twisted. But um, assuming you've signed up to these clauses, then you've got to make sure you deal with them and, and adhere to them. So a typical notice clause might say that issues here, you know, my man's got notices, it tells you about notices on variations, it tells you about, in this case, notices on claims, i.e. delay claims, uh, disruption claims, and it tells you about time bars. And then, as it clearly says here, if you fail to comply with, and it's not clauses 16.1, 16.2, 16.3, 16.4, and those clauses may have a whole load of sub clauses, which I've not bothered identifying here, but that contract says if you fail to comply with those clauses, then number one, the big bad builder will not be liable at all for anything that you claim, and you will be absolutely barred from claiming anything. Now, if you've got contract clauses that are given to you, and you you know, went off to site at six o'clock tomorrow morning and those clauses said that on that, please download. Well, sorry, but you've signed up to those clauses, whether you realize it or not. So that's why I say don't lift a finger until you until you're happy to review the contract. This is a, an evil contract that uh, some of our mining um, big mining sort of companies in, in uh, Australia, West Australia, will have in there. And what that's saying is, if I say I asked you to put in three conveyors on my mine site, and then I give you a variation and ask you to put two more, two more conveyors in at $6 million each or $60 million each, and you think, great, I'm getting paid for these extra conveyors. You might be getting paid for the extra conveyors, but you won't be entitled to any more money for the fact that it's going to take you a year longer to to uh, put it in. Now, clauses like this are just evil, and when you're doing the contract review before you've started works, of course, you look at that and you ask that question when I'm saying negotiate, and you ask the question, so what does this mean? If you give me that variation that extends my job for a year, I'm not entitled to any increase for you know, for all my additional staffing. And if they go, well, of course you are, then you go, well, in that case, let's cross this out and amend that contract so that it reads like that. Because at the moment, it doesn't read like that. This now says sole remedy. Conditions president is our friend, John Hollands. Um, and I mean, you look at this clause 10.6, and conditions president mean that basically you must do whatever these things are said in order to obtain the entitlement. So here, condition president for the subject of the entitlement to extension time is that you must not have caused or contributed. You've taken all steps necessary to avoid. No reasonable programming could have reduced it. Um, you must not have been given instruction 10.11. So this is clause 10.7. You've got to go to 10.11 to see what, what that means. You must have given notices in accordance with 10.6. So you've got to go back to 10.6 to see what that means. You must have given notices in accordance with 17.8. So you've got to see what that clause means. And so on. And then it says you will have no claim against John Holland if you fail to comply with any of these requirements of 10.7. Now, you look at that and you roll your eyes. But these, these clauses are not illegal. They are... They might be 99.999% close enough to illegal, but the judge and the courts don't consider that illegal. They say that a competent subcontractor can read those words and has made the decision to proceed with the contract with those words, then they must adhere to them. So 
it's just a words of warning here on contract clauses that you know have a look see what it is you're being asked to sign up to and decide whether you can if you haven't got the contract administrative team to be able to deal with this and you just got a bunch of electricians are going to be flat out busy pulling cables and they haven't got time to write letters and comply with all these provisions then think seriously about whether you want to sign up this contract or say at the beginning when you're negotiating look i can't do this i need this clause knocked out or simplified you'll be surprised a lot of contractors if they because all the reason why they've invited you to tender is because they want you so they may actually be sympathetic to look into amendments because at that stage, nobody's lost any money and nobody's lost any time. <clears throat> so, you know, negotiation, negotiation is the key there. So this one here is saying programming. It's calling you a contractor rather than the superstructure in this case, but you will not depart from the program. So they've given you a program, presumably, or you've had to give, and what, give a program at the beginning, a schedule, a program, and saying what work you're doing and what sequence you're doing and what durations roughly now if if uh you know you you were held up if you intended to go from items a b c d and you can't go to a and b and c because others are in the way so naturally you want to go to d and e what they're saying is if you think that that's going to be a problem you've got to notify them in writing and telling them about the possible delay now you what, what in other words what you're saying is don't use your common sense almost make them think of it as you've got their wallet in your hand you've got to spend their money with their approval so even though everybody in construction particularly subcontractors are all very good at fixing main contractors problems but they do it just without actually saying, I can do this, but um, but I need your instruction to do it. In other words, working out of sequence and starting a program activities D and E, and then going back to A, B, and C. That's what this clause would be telling you. <clears throat> hopefully, hopefully this is making sense, guys. I'm obviously without immediate feedback in the room, it's a bit hard to sort of judge, but Hopefully you're still there and, and grasping what I'm saying here. <clears throat> so then you've got bizarre clauses. You know, that's one line I've often made. Oh, well, the builder never gives me a program. Um, and that's a common comment from subcontractors. You're the finishing trade. He's got every other man and his dog in there at the moment. He hasn't even updated his program. He's just getting everybody working, shooting from the hip. <clears throat> then you've got clauses like this where they actually write them in in advance of that. They're saying... You keep yourself informed about what's going on on the program. I'm not, I haven't got to have the obligation to tell you. And oh, by the way, you request copies of my program. I mean, you know, these clauses are almost just rude. You know, they're virtually saying, I'm not going to bother programming the works. You do it for me. But if you don't request a copy of my program, then that's not my fault that um, you're getting held up. Again, at tender time, you look at these clauses. And you can get these amended. You can cross them out. You can write different words, whatever. You know, there's, that's the whole point about negotiation of a contract. Now, if you do get a program, which uh, I know that, again, most of you will get a program that's, by the time the program is bound, in, bound into your contract, it's not looking like this, the plan completion. It's looking like this, where it's completely slipped out and got a huge amount of delay. <clears throat> My point here, here is that if if it's like that from the get-go, then you need to be signing up with the program being, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you want to say that they're the commencement dates of activities, not, not the grey bars. Secondly, if the grey bars is where it was when you got commenced the work, but as a result of other trades, other impacts, late delivery materials, access restrictions, all those things that are common. But because of all those things, you now are finishing where the red bars are. What this blue cloud is saying, of course, is if the contract says, give me the notices, write the letters, do all of these things. And if you don't do all those things, then you kiss goodbye, 
like I say, to any entitlement for money and extension time, and you buy yourself the privilege of liquidated damages. So I'm not wanting to turn, you know, be doom and gloom all the time here. I'm just trying to say that depending on what type of projects you're working on, these are the sort of things you have to consider. As I know, lots of subcontractors, sub uh, this is a bit of tongue in cheek, but um, again, I'm trying to get a point across. When I get asked to assist contractors, subcontractors with with claims at the end of the job, and as they told me all the tales of woe about the builders caused this and held them there, and and then I say, yeah, that's great, but <clears throat> show me the records that you wrote down to capture all this. And of course, <clears throat> I then find that the records are very limited, if at all existing and again it, that's fine when you're working with people who've got ethics and are equally as credible as you but the reality is if they're not then you've got a problem very quickly you have probably heard these lines a million times again don't worry about it we'll sort it out at the end and like i say the tongue-in-cheek picture there is that yes that's what unfortunately many subcontractors get but if you've kept on top of your notices and you don't have to write war and peace you haven't got to be a lawyer to write these notices these notices can be just very simple um simple notices just you know hey here's a photo everyone's got phones with photos you know cameras here i intended to install lights here in this room room bt uh, here's a photo of them showing no ceiling grid in. So until the ceiling contractor has finished his works, I can't even start mine. Please accept this as a notice of delay. That's about it, really. You don't need to go into any. You've got sufficient detail there to to you know to get a point across. Yes, the contract might say do it in a bit more format, a bit more um, particular way, and if you can do that, great. But if you can't, then it's better than nothing, is what I'm saying. Change process of keeping records, again, I know it's, it's obvious, but, um, but try and keep records, try and get some sort of management system, whether it's electronic filing system or hard copy. A bolded CVIs as in confirmation of verbal instructions, because you're often told, hey, don't work over there, work over there verbally by the site foreman well if you've got the whole crew of guys it was all rocked up all unloaded all the tools of the ute went up to the seventh floor of the building and then you're told to go and work in a different annexure building you want to do it as discussed john no problem i'll move over there just put your initials there can you just saying move from here to here you just want something to try and capture that because if you don't then you've done it for free Photographs, I love it. You know, photographs are great. When I'm involved with disputes, and I've given loads of photos, I can and the time time of photographs, I can see what's caused what where, and it helps paint the picture after the fact. So keep good records. Here is as uh, was helping um, well, it was an electrician up on you know a woodside project. And I've just gave, created a bit of a template for them that's their particular job. And this is to try and get them into writing down a site record, you know, giving the, giving the guys the fields so that they can just have it in their book, you know, it was a variation, whatever, that they can click what they think it is. Um, scribble some words, you know, it doesn't, you can, if you fill it in, great. If you don't, if you fill it in more detail, great. If you don't, but it, hopefully it's enough to prompt. Um, if you've got a contract administrator on the job, hopefully it's enough to then give that information back to a contract administrator to then for him to then ask questions after. So I noticed you scribbled something here. Can you just tell me a bit more about it? You know, go and see the guy in the field that's, that's seen it. You know, these are tips for get some video if you can, whatever. So I'd encourage trying to do that and create yourself a bit of a template on any project you're working on. And they vary, the templates for different projects vary. So here, I'm on about change, you know, change management, but instead of variations this time, it's delays. Obviously, 
you know, it's usual thing. You've got to work as quick as you can. You've got to jump, jump around if you can, you know, mitigate delays by working on other things. That's great. Um, you've always got to be mindful that you're trying to protect yourself from liquidated damages. And the only way you can do that is in contracts, most written contracts, is by giving them notices and showing extensions of time are needed uh, to avoid liquidated damages. Hopefully most of you understand what I'm saying there on extension of time, liquidated damages. So if you don't, please shout up. Delays, yeah, like I say, they're nearly always experienced. Just, uh, you've just got to decide who's, who's cost. Of course, the builder will, will always try and suggest it's your fault. And the key is, is you've got to write and say that, you know, you're not slow because you've had insufficient resources. What you've done is you've, Reduce your number of resources because they've only got five work fronts instead of the planned 55 work fronts. So there's always the ways that, to deal with sneaky builders who try and suggest it's the problem's yours and not theirs. So the whole point about change management, and again, there's another uh, generated another typical notice letter, um, and this one's a letter, the letter that you'd send to demonstrate your entitlements. So this might be, you know, you, you write this for that project, put your project's name in. Um, this is a note in accordance with clauses, whatever the clauses of the contract might say. You say, might consider the program, hit the program. And it's only possible there at this time, but um, the reason why on in this particular contract you had to do the notice was because the contract said, if you think you're going to be delayed, you've got to tell me within five business days of that delay, otherwise, um, of the delay event, otherwise you've missed your chance to recover anything. So, oops, sorry. So here I've got these extracts of the clauses, so it's, you just, the chip box, was it a force majeure? A force majeure, if you don't know, is um, an event outside of your control, like a typical act of God sort of thing, flood fires, that sort of thing, of a major national strike, whatever. Um, so just tick box it, it's a variation in accordance with that, it's a breach. Do the ticks, try and say what it is. This one's to do with delay, so. And then you provide the details, some details if you can. Attached is a photo, um, you know, showing this. It might be just some brief notice, but you're just, you're getting the point across, you've written it on a certain date, and you've told, told them what, the problem that you've got. And then the particulars, if you can try and say what the delay is, who's what it was, who was impacting you, was it another subcontractor? Like I say, just have a digest of these after, it's fairly straightforward. But if your contract, and not all of your contracts would need this kind of level of detail. But the point when I've said right at the beginning about all people at all stages being involved, these are Details, if you've got a contract administrator, it's a mine site project, and you've got a contract admin administrator down in, in Sydney or Perth or wherever, who only goes to site reluctantly every now and then, and does the seagull, seagull treatment, fly in, fly out very quickly. Um, he doesn't know these details. He doesn't even know these things are happening. The people that need to know this, or the people that know all of these details are the electricians that are on site pulling cables right at the coalface. So that's why it's important to get them involved with this process, because they're the ones that scribble the notes in here. Yes, the commercial manager or whatever, or contract administrator might do a bit of polish and then need to ask questions about what you've written to then be able to fill it, finish it off. But they're the ones that capture the information. They they're capture the causes. With regard to variations, I've got a similar things. You've got to look at any any and everything that might hit you, whether it's your scope, your specifications. Um, most of them, yeah, most variations have a cost impact, and most of your super projectors typically do variations for free or at a very minimal cost because you don't want to sort of be seen to be bullying you or being claims merchant and chasing money all the time. But lots of variations are half a day delay, half a day delay, half a day delay. And one variation on your own, you know you can deal with it. But when you've got 20 half a day delay variations, then you're in trouble. 
So it's worth um, keeping an eye on these things and um, making sure that you don't you know, fall out of timing. Again, the contracts might say time bar. So I won't go through this one, it's self-explanatory, but basically is a typical variation request. You know, these requests because it's you've directed me to do some extra work or somebody else has you know, asked me for a proposal or, or whatever. I'd say you, you have a look at these at your leisure. These, these are just pro formers of a particular project. <clears throat> now, to get to some interesting example. So Perth Children's Hospital, um, I was involved and have been involved on that job for quite some time, helping subcontractors against uh, further up the line and against main contractors, John Holland being the main contractor. Here's one example, I got called up by an electric, electrical contractor, or actually fire services, and the job was going to be two years late virtually, and they called me a week before they were supposed to have finished under the contract. Hadn't done any extension of time claims, hadn't done any real notices it turned out, but I looked at the liquidated damages clause, and at the time they were, you know, six months late, as it like I say, it ended up being two years. And I then fell off my chair when I saw the liquidated damages at ninety thousand dollars a day. Now their contract value was about four million dollars. It wasn't a big contract. It wasn't even the liquidated damages were not even capped. So they had actually bought themselves this wonderful opportunity to be liable for $65 million, a $4 million contract. Now, we had to do, my, my firm had to do a lot of work trying to demonstrate extensions of time to recover their delays and so that they couldn't get levied by liquidated damages. And that was great. I thought, great, now we've done that, so of course we can now claim your, claim all your costs for your 30 staff and whatever and all your site buildings that have been working on the job for two years. And that's when I looked at this other clause and it said, oh no, the contract's already got an agreed damages and that you'll only be entitled to be paid for the amount that's in there. I'm praying that it's something not near to $90,000 a day. But no, they'd managed to sign up to agreed damages of one dollar a day recovery to pay for all their overheads. Now you, you might be sitting there thinking that that can't be right, that should be illegal. Well if you remember at the beginning when I said about a contract needs to be legal intent and you know needs the intent of legal capacity, intent, clarity, offer and acceptance and the point is consideration and the consideration is was there the other but other side gave consideration. Yes, it was only one dollar, but it was consideration. And so they knew that if they didn't have consideration, the courts would say that they haven't fulfilled the requirements. So 99% evil, but just not 100% to turn it into illegal. So, of course, all we could do is secure $700 worth of prolongation for them, which the project manager practically can get out of his back pocket. The, the client didn't like us because they thought we cost a fortune. I kept reminding them that every day we save is $90,000 we've saved them and we're not charging them that, I can tell you. So, it's um, when I say about contract reviews, when I say about reading the contract beginning, I think it's pretty self-explanatory that this client wishes that they had spent that time at the beginning. And if they didn't get these terms changed, then they should have walked away from the job. Um, that's also something that you subcontractors are your own worst enemies for, you, you sign up to the contract regardless. So anyway, it's um, a point to consider. And here's a, a, an example from a, a recent legal case to demonstrate why it's not me that's suggesting you need to review your contracts. You need to amend the terms before you sign up to them. And then if you've signed up to terms, you need to comply with them. Because this case in the Supreme Court, again with our friends John Holland, only this case it was a company CMA against John Holland, the judge handed down his decision, uh, a very long-winded decision, and paragraph 865 of his decision said, basically, and I'll, before I turn to that, is that CMA couldn't finish the job any earlier because John Holland was causing delay. 
they were doing notices kind of maybe possibly but not doing it in accordance with the strict requirements of the contract and so John Holland said you're not entitled to an extension of time and there's an argument and yes the judge handed down this decision essentially saying that CMA failed to comply with the procedures of the contract and if it was a six month delay they're saying because you failed to claim your extension of time in accordance with the contract I therefore say you haven't got an entitlement to extension of time so you go backwards to the original date because you've gone backwards to the original date the judge said, therefore, John Holland are entitled to levy liquidated damages against you, even though John Holland were the cause of the bloody delays. So the judges have gone the legal system now saying ignorance and non-compliance with the written contract is no excuse to the fact that um, your, the other side is entitled to claim monies against you. So now it's, you now have got the full force of the law telling subcontractors if you have got a contract that says do something in this case under clause 1012 and it does it in a particular procedure then guess what do it the judges are not interested in you saying yeah but well, I was busy getting on with the job the judges are saying if it says what it says do it if you don't do it then you do that you're doing that at risk so fortunately for CMA, they got a cap on their liquidated damages of just up to 10% of their contract value. So they only had to pay $1.1 million to John Holland, um, but they didn't recover any of their delay costs. And I guess this is the point, is that the courts are being quite critical of, of subcontractors who don't comply with the contract terms that they've signed up to. The bit I'm saying at the bottom about the court pendulum, so there used to be, or well, there still is, you know, legal sort of um, doctrine about prevention principle, which basically says you, John Holland, that principle says John Holland shouldn't get unjust enrichment, i.e. money, in, to, in this case, $1.1 million out of me, the poor subcontractor, when it was them that prevented me from completing on time. And the courts... That is a doctrine, but the, in this case, the judge decided the written terms sit higher than that. And then the waiver and estoppel bit is, as I said earlier, obviously CMA said that John Holland's not enforced these strict requirements in the last eight months, so therefore they can't suddenly do it now. And um, any stop means that, that they can't do it, i.e. they should be stopped from doing it now. S stopped is stopped. But the judge decided, no, the, court, the clause that they've got in the contract said that they can do it. So, too bad, too sad. So, again, I don't want to tell you any tales of woe unless they were necessary. So, hence, ensure you negotiate realistic terms, adhere to them, comply with them, and um, work as best as you can to get the job finished. If there's any questions, I say, Feel free to ask them, otherwise uh, I'll just keep going. So, final account. Um, that stage, I'll, I'll skip to. I mean, basically, it's obviously lo lots of people, that's where you've, you've worked all the time and hopefully you've, you've covered your costs up to your final progress claim. And your final progress claim is where you want to try and recover your money, your profit. It's essentially closure. You know, there's all works, and I say emphasis on the all works is to be performed, and that's all works is not just the physical works, of course, it's MDRs, as built drawings, um, uh, you know, remeasures, things like that. Um, and, you know, the key about that stage of the project is practical completion is where you, you now back to your retentions, that's when you get retention release or half retention typically it's you know five percent retention that's held up to practical completion of which two and a half percent is released at pre-c and the other two and a half is released 12 months after the defect liability period so you want to get practical completion um as quickly as possible and you certainly want the certificate because often the contracts will say without the certificate you're not entitled to claim your retention so so I always recommend on big big contracts that subcontractors look at what are the requirements for 
for a final final compliant, final account and practical completion. What are the things you need to do? <clears throat> and so in terms of you know what you don't want to do is as a lot of builders do, they you reach practical completion today on the eighth of October, but they don't agree with it initially and they keep saying, No, if you can come back and just do this, if you can come back and just do this, just touch this up. And that goes on from the 8th of October through to the 3rd of March next year. And not only have you not had your release of retention, but when they finally say, OK, you've reached it now, they then start the 12 month defect liability period then, or try to. The fact that you should have started now in October rather than you know, the five months later. So that's why you know, you've got to push for this and push them and lead them to get it as locked in as soon as possible. Obviously, like I say, liabilities transfer at that point. You know, you don't want to be insurance liability of it. Um, you want to pass it out as soon as possible. So look at the procedures when you're doing your contract review and see if these procedures are very long-winded and if they are, whether you can get them amended to, um, to suit. Yeah, all of, the, all of these deliverables are typical things that you would uh, often be asked to get. So. Don't leave it till the three days before that you now need to start you know, doing your MDRs and as built drawings because you're just giving them a reason to not have release of retention so, uh, and not give you granted PC. Um, uh, you know, same things again control all your subcontractors if it's a big job and you've got several subcontractors. You make sure you give them timely sort of warning about getting there because you don't want any reason to have delay of PC and delay of release of retention and delay of um, you know the start of your defect liability period that you're working on. And also, the, like I say, the exposure to liquidated damages. If they keep trying to suggest you haven't reached PC, then then obviously if you've if the contractual date for PC was the 8th of October, but by the time they say you've achieved it was the 3rd of March, then they say you're exposed to liquidated damages from the 8th of October through to the 3rd of March. Now, you might have physically finished the work, but you might not have finished all these, you know, the O&M documentation, things like that. So, so just important stage to not overlook. Uh, again, I'll... Yeah, they're self-explanatory. The, the other things, get all your variations. A lot of people leave all the pricing of the variations properly. Everything's on account. You've got 412 variations, and now you've got to give all the bit substantiation and they, the final accounts, and they go, oh, well, you haven't given me it yet. So and it's just, it's a stall if you, you know, on, on a builder's side often. So preempt it. You know you're going to get there eventually, so preempt that before it gets there. Um, yeah, that's it. Claims, you know, on that same process with claims, don't, don't, uh, if you've got claims because of delays or disruptions, you know, negotiate actively with these things. Try and, when, when you're, when you're useful and valuable on the job is when you've got most chance of negotiation. Once the project's finished and you've given them everything, they've got no, um, no desire to deal with you. They'll deal with you when they want to. So. It's just a, a point to consider. <clears throat> so dispute avoidance and resolution. That's a, a stage. Like I say, there's lots of topics about that. Everyone probably gets involved with disputes on a daily basis. You know, you just realize, just deal with them and you fix them, i.e. any disagreement. So in terms of what's a dispute, it's very common. Um, and basically, you know, any disagreement can go on. The, there's the interpretation is a very common thing. The contracts, when I said at the beginning about the contracts need clarity. When you've got terms that are very um, open-ended, you, you need to, when you review it, um, you know, and if, it's, if it says electrician is to install all electrical works necessary for uh, the whole of the school building, that's way too open. You need to narrow that down so that you don't get 
Um, <clears throat> don't get screwed for things that you didn't consider you you should have ever allowed for. You'd say, no, I need a specific scope. It's a dispute. You obviously you know, don't want to get into dispute resolution <clears throat> because the resolution stage, everybody's at um, fever pitch. You're already losing money. Nobody's happy. And then you've got people like me or Nika Legal having to help you incurring your further costs. So dispute avoidance is obviously the best approach. And avoidance is planning well ahead. Like I said, it goes back to the beginning. Sign up to contract terms that have terms that you can handle, not sole remedy or huge notice provisions that you'll never comply with. <clears throat> then review it, you know, the scope of works. Make sure it's make sure everything in the contract is is what you've wanted and what you've expected. The communications is always important at any stage, a negotiation stage. Once you've started the works, constantly keep those communications open because you, you know relationships. As soon as they start to go south, um, things problems escalate. Yeah, you know, in terms of applying the contract, it's how can it help? It's um, just simply help because you're dealing with the provisions. What you you're making them the other side deal with the contract provisions rather than just. Ignoring, you know, and if you've got a problem and merits of issues, you're making them deal with those problems rather than just dealing with um, rejection because you've not complied with the contracts. <clears throat> and so, yeah, your liabilities, you know, watch out for these sort of time bars that in this John Holland one, it notice dispute must be given within seven days. If you don't do it within seven days, so if you're sitting there and having to think about raising a notice and raising a dispute, the longer that you, it just make sure in this contract, if you thought and thought, now I'll give it a week, I'll go on holiday, I'll come back, and then, yeah, I'm going to raise this to dispute. They said, there's too bad, you missed it. So, so it's always, you know, always been important to read these Weasley clauses and make sure that they're either crossed out, amended, or, um, or you comply with them. <clears throat> this is such an obvious, you know, such and such company rejects such and such's claim on the basis that the subcontractor failed to meet the obligations of the subcontractor. That's how easy it is. You've written a 50 page claim, spent ages getting the details, and that's all they write. Or another one. You hereby notify blank that your October progress claim, necessary payment claim, is rejected on the basis you failed to meet the obligations for the reasons provided. So, I guess my point here is that with both of these, both of those provisions there, they've not even really dealt with the merits of what you're claiming. They haven't said your claim for restricted working is incorrect because here attached are photos showing that you've got plenty of room. Um, you know, they're not dealing with the merits. They're just simply saying you failed to comply with the contract. You didn't give me the notice in accordance with the contract, so I don't even have to deal with. The claim that you've written, you just didn't give it me on time. So what you want for dispute avoidance, you want to make sure that these things, you don't fall over on these time bars and technical failures. To force them, if you've got a claim, that they have to then deal with your claim. Very, you know, disputes, of course, can happen at any time, and um, and they can escalate. You know, so you've got to think about what happens. You. Encourage your team, you know, to, to talk um, and, and keep those informed. If you think, see a lot of them are project managers against clients, project manager have a personality clash, and it's often sensible to consider removing people and switching people out if that's uh, feasible. So in this scenario here, is you tendered a job, insert a rate, bill of quants, the rates. Doesn't allow for the full extent of the ancillary work, you know. The uh, contractor failed to qualify the extent. Um, and then, of course, you put in claims for the extra work. They say, no, refuse to pay. Um, and they say it's part of your BOQ and your rates. Hey, you've got a dispute. So, obviously, to avoid all that would have been to negotiate those terms clearer so that you don't get into that. 
but you know if you've got into that it's how do you document it how do you follow it how do you deal with it in terms of the procedure um dispute resolution procedures um there are numbers of things negotiation mediation i'm not going to dwell on these because we'll be here for a month of sundays but main one i'd focus obviously on is adjudication just because it's quick um, negotiation of course sorry very good if you can negotiate great because you've not involved anybody if you can't negotiate then you've got to engage third parties either a mediator an adjudicator an arbitrator or a judge so in terms of yeah that's a process but and again I, I won't dwell on this here for claims because i'm assuming most of you uh, well if you do have claims you may may consider getting all external people to assist you putting together a claim but essentially you know these are the sort of form things that you would have claims on claims to do not under certification of variations or extension of time or prolongation being the delay part costs associated with the time <clears throat> disruption because you, your productivity has gone to shop because every other trades in the way and you can't get on or acceleration where they say another contract wants you to finish on the you know 5th of december but i want you to finish on the 5th of november please implement acceleration measures these are all things that have got costs so nobody's going to pay you money nowadays uh, without you demonstrating it in in detail so that's just a fact of life so you've got to get on with it so so you look at what it is you look at the records and you try and put together a claim so a typical and this is obviously a rough wet thumb basis but a typical claim format would be you know you, you've if this was here as a piecemeal issue of design information so the job was delayed so you do a statement of claim you do the basis of the claim in terms of what the contractual basis of your claim you put the facts in which you're relying on because um let the engineer fail to give design information you show on a program what what it's done to your practical completion in terms of delay you show what mitigation measures you've done mitigation being just you know that you've you've changed sequencing to try and help you demonstrate your costs you know attach um costing information and obviously do a conclusion that's roughly the framework of a claim um so so the key things of course is records you know and, and uh, this next graph picture will show you why records are a key because if you don't have records it's very hard to deal with deal with things so deal with the issues comply with the contract and try not to deal with it after the job's finished for obvious reasons the next next um next graph graphic is basically tells why i'm saying what i'm saying so if you rely on verbal instructions and verbal conversations and you're picking up the phone and you're talking to you your counterpart that's great if the dispute goes in front of an arbitrator or an adjudicator or an arb you know a judge in about seven minutes from now because you've everything's fairly fresh but of course those processes don't happen they happen at best a month later realistically a year later so if you're relying on verbal evidence this is how the judge looks at it they go basically if you're telling me a year from now that you remember this conversation at 5:56 on the 8th of October uh, that John said this and I said that, well, the judge won't really, and I wouldn't as an adjudicator put a lot of weight to that. That your memory is so good that you remember that conversation. But if you had that conversation and you sent an email, um, hey John, as discussed, I agree X Y Z. Well, that email written then is equally as good now, uh, a year later. And so I would put lots of evidence, waiting evidence on that. So that's why I keep rambling on about capture records and evidence to try and help yourself, because it's, it's in your interest. So this top 10 tips, we're nearly there, guys. So the top 10 tips, uh, they're pretty much everything that I've said, I'm just reiterating again, which is have your own terms and conditions, ideally. Be best to get to. Um, okay, Dion's asked who'd be best to get a basic set of terms and conditions created. 
Um, the, the, the obvious answer immediately will be NECA legal. Um, they have they have terms and conditions templates that they'd probably be able to do. Um, you know, otherwise, yeah, I mean, anyone could do it. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, people like myself could do it, but I'd say this in the first instance, you go to, to NECA legal for sure, because they've already got electrical uh, trades terms and conditions in place. So um, I suggest Dion that you get in touch with either Johnny or, or Giles or Joe will link you with them shorts sometime after this. In terms of um, uh, advice on welfare retentions, title clauses included on your own terms and conditions. Um, in, in terms of, right, so Linda's asking advice on the welfare retentions of title clauses. Um, I would, I would say retentions. In, so you're not meaning retentions in this case of retentions of money. Your retentions of um, purity on 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 things and property of goods. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess if you if you put those terms in there, um, your your retention of your things. I would I would be of your goods. I'd be trying to do. Uh, Keep them off site if at all possible. I'd be I'd spell it out and put that in there in your tenant that until they're incorporated within the project and fully paid for, then they remain my property. Um, in practical terms, of course, if they're installed in 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 the end product, in the in the, then you know there'll be good arguments say that now they're part of the works and, and therefore not your goods. So. But uh, you know, if there are particular things, if you were installing air conditioning units, or and there are expensive or expensive units that I'd be keeping them until the last minute, and then maybe having particular special conditions on on how to deal with those. Maybe that you know, when you're supplying them, then you paid half the monies up front, and then the other half of the payment for the big items of goods are, are paid upon installation, maybe. You can write whatever terms you want. The idea is is negotiation at tender time. Um, so th that that's the advice I'd say on that, Lyndon. But in terms of the conclusion, no problem. In terms of the conclusion, I'd say yeah, as I said, abide by. Um, you know, look at look at the tendering, re review your contracts, and then t don't don't rush to go out there until you've you're happy with it. Then comply with the contracts. Do the CVIs, the photos, the emails. Keep on top of things. You know that as Sparkies, you're going to typically you're finishing trade, so you're already going in there after the fact and after um, all the other trades have screwed up and are screwing up. And you're supposed to wave a magic wand. Well, the reality is you can't always do that. So you've got to just keep dropping notices in and putting insurance policies effectively in place. So that if they, I mean, if they're ethical and they pay you the money, fine, it's not a problem. But if they're not, then that's when you need to rely on those documents. Avoid disputes if you can. Uh, negotiate, adjudicate if if you can, because that's adjudication is 28 days from start to finish, effectively. So if you've got a 12-month contract, you haven't got to wait for 12 months or start a long and expensive arbitration process through lawyers. You can. You can do adjudication very quickly, and then understand you know you know the processes, and don't don't be afraid to seek advice along the way because there's um you know people like myself, Johnny Giles, they can help you along the way and give you lots of good advice uh, that can prevent things going into problems. Remember the 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 graphic at the beginning: make money. That's the that's the primary directive. So this is just, again, a bit of tongue in cheek, but trying to get the point across and reiterate the point. So why do so many, you know, lose money on projects? Because they're all too willing to do, as I said at the beginning, put the blindfold on, grab the grab the order and sign it, and yay, open the beers and have fun. All I'm saying is, before you do that, that's your that's your five to five PO that came through today, telling you to six o'clock tomorrow morning, and everyone is down at the pub and enjoying themselves. They haven't actually done what they should have done, which is looked at the terms and conditions that were on that website, for, in this case BGC, 
And they haven't actually looked at those terms and conditions and seen that they're signing up to giving their left kidney um, to the other side, to the main contractor. Again, records, you know, I've said about records, don't just rely on verbal. You know, you, you really do need to keep records because you never know. Look at them just purely as an insurance policy. The way I always say to it is um, you don't buy a car insurance with the intention of crashing. You're happy to pay money with the car insurance, put it in the glove compartment and never see it again. The reason why you do that is because you know the cost of in the event you crash is massive. Well, I'm saying the same for you don't capture your records, dropping your notices in. They're all insurance policies. You don't intend to rely on them because you expect to get paid what you're supposed to be paid. But if your client, for whatever reason, goes through difficult times and forces themselves to start to be screwing you rather than taking it on the chin themselves, that's when you need your records. Programs, another one. Lots of people get a program but don't really look at it. If the program says work in the orders of ABCD, then if you can't work in ABC, then as I said in the slides earlier, let the other side know that you can't do A and B and here's a photo of the reasons why. And then say I can do C and D, but I need your instruction to that I can work out of sequence. Just just to avoid major problems. Then I hear people saying to me, you know, why don't why don't they uh, you know when adhere to sort of the terms of the contract. And again, this is one of the problems. You, you, you've got your main contractor, the foreman, you start to give your notices, and of course they throw you out. <laughs> they don't understand them. Yes, exactly, they don't understand them. I mean, it's, um, you know, you put a delay notice in and the builder doesn't want to see that, and he says, oh, don't be like this. You know, I'll see you right at the end. And so you think, oh, I don't want to be the bad subcontractor giving me notices. Yeah, I'm sure he'll tell you that all the other subcontractors don't do that, but the point is, you do then what he says, and you don't put the notice in, so therefore you've not complied with the contract, and you've worked on the handshake and the trust basis, and then they use that very same contract that you didn't adhere to, and then they beat you over the head with it, and you're left high and dry. You know, you come see me then, I say, well, you've had your arm in the fire for eight months, I can only pull it out, I can't fix it. So, a lot to digest, everybody there, but um, hopefully, hopefully that was of some use. Uh, like I say, I've gone through the whole aspects of agreements, administration, final account, and disputes. So, if there's any questions that you think of now or later, then I'm happy to take them another day, or or you forward them through to Joe. Everybody's got Joe's details, and. Um, yeah, Joe can communicate with you directly. He'll send you all emails anyway. But um, if there's any questions now, um, no problem. Thanks, thanks everybody. If you appreciated that, then if there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, yeah, by all means, feed it through there. And um, good luck in the world out there. It's a crazy time. Hi everybody, it's um, Joe Ogden here, I'm the project manager at NECA. Thank you so much for being involved in this webinar. We really appreciate you being engaged with NECA and taking the time out of your evening to um, to sign in and listen to David. And thank you very much for David. He's been working with us for a number of years. We get really good attendance at the workshops, but we're trying to respond to the members' um, requests, particularly for the regional ones, and find some ways of either coming out to visit you, which uh, tech buyers do, but for these seminars, just using the technology to um, be able to reach out to you. So uh, thank you for your, uh, David, for being our, our guinea pig. This is the, <laughs> the first time we've done this and we'd like to do a lot more. Um, I was a bit lax in uh, starting the record button, but the, the idea is to record these and then Claire, our events manager, will have them up available on our website. So if uh, we had a couple of people who registered tonight who couldn't make it, you can access it then or if you want to go back later um, and listen to, to David's dulcet tones again, you can do that at your leisure. Um, but that's the idea to try and make more of the, the seminars available across to everybody. Um, as David said, we'll send some information out to you. Uh, Dee, on your particular question about the terms and conditions, I'll flick an email through to Johnny and Giles at NECA Legal and just introduce you, but I'll, I'll pop on there that flyer with the terms and condition quotes so you've got all the information there. 
But if there's anything else, just yeah, as David said, get in touch. I'll flick an email through with David's uh, contact details as well. So if you wanted to contact him directly, uh, feel free to, to welcome on that side of it. If there's nothing else, we'll um, sign off from here and enjoy the rest of your night. Yes, I've uh, been talking for too long. I think it's time for a beer. So <laughs> cheers, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sue.